Good evening and welcome to the Central and Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 15th of March, the Ides of March. It's a little blustery out there today. <clears throat> Looks like the wind's calming down a little bit. Um, tonight we have our minutes on the agenda. We also have a budget presentation from the Franklin County Tech School and we have our usual um, COVID-19 update. We've got a a slot for any budget discussions and then any select board and town administrator updates. So let's kick it off with the minutes from our last meeting, March 8th. <clears throat> I'll make a motion on the minutes. Second. All right. all right. All those in favor of the minutes from Monday, March 8th. Aye. 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 All right. Three to zero on the minutes. All right, next up, we've got the uh, special guest, Rick Martin from the Franklin County Tech School to do their annual budget presentation. How are you? How are you doing, everybody? Good, Rick. How are you? Doing well. Um, about how much time do I have? Six minutes. Three minutes. All and right. Oh, no, I gave you <laughs> twice as much. All right, so we'll say Just four, say then no. we'll shoot the no split in the middle. Four. Okay. I'm only no increases this year. <laughs> I have two different versions of the budget. One has more of a multimedia flavor and one's a little bit quicker, the expedited version. So I know this is a pretty good group, a veteran group that knows a lot about us. So I'll go through the expedited version of that. If, okay. I, if anyone wants to see any media associated with any of the things, please let me know and I can easily turn that to the next slide. What I would need, however, is I would need, um, can I share my screen? Yes. Oh yeah, go for it. Okay, I should be able to do that. Good. Yep. Oh, perfect. Let's see. Um, we love graphic presentations here. All right. Russ is already smiling back there too. <laughs> I'll do shadow. But six minutes will be yeah, perfect. There you go. <laughs> All right. Let's see what I got. Uh, I think this is the one. It's yeah. The, 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 yep, I got the right one. All right. So, so you this, went to Deerfield to take a picture of us. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um, I flew the uh, the Franklin County helicopter over, and I took a few snapshots. There you go. Um, I told you, I'm going to get you caught up in the first half of the screen, um, and then um, Russ and I will um, update you where we are with the Sunderland numbers, what the expectations are for next year, and what the assessments are moving forward. So right now we have um, what we've done since the last time we met is we increased our AP courses through the ESSER II funds. Um, and due to increased enrollment, we added a financial literacy program, but that's really adding back to what we cut seven years ago. Um, and we have a woman in trades program. We're on our third construction of our home with an agreement we started several years back with the Greenfield Savings Bank that they buy all of the supplies, materials in the land and they do the excavation and our students come in and we build it. We take the profits from that and we start a new project. So that keeps us up and running and keeps our operating budget much lower because you can imagine the supplies and materials that we don't have to spend now on that. Um, and we uh, continue with our Tech Connect summer program. Of course, with remote learning, there's been a new emphasis on credit recovery and remote learning. So we invested into those particular programs. I think the last time we met, we were thinking about starting a medical assistant program and an LPM program. We're expected to be in full, fully engaged in that by next fall. We received a $250,000 competitive grant um, to get that up and started. And, and then a $200,000 machine tech grant to continue with our precision machines. The importance of that is we do have an adult learning program in collaboration with GCC and the Regional Employment Workforce Board, which um, has 15 adult learners that come in um, one time in the fall and then another group in the spring. So in the last seven years, we graduated 150 with a 90, just over 90% positive employment rate. So we're really excited about that particular that's program. Good. And that program is just, uh, we got to keep pumping money into it. It's just too good for our community with all these jobs that um, it's not necessarily for our graduates, it's for anybody. And I think it really works out well. 
And so, um, as indicated last year, just to kind of compile on, just in the last several years, we've received $1.2 million in, in competitive grants going to various shop programs. So I that see. really allows us to elevate our programs without going out to the towns. And so that's an important um, component. And uh, facility initiatives, a new veterinary program is um, already started. We're in our second year. We add one new grade level a year. Um, but it's inside of our existing school with a growing population. So we're kind of getting kind of crowded. We are fortunate that this year was a year where we had half of our population in the building and not everybody because it's getting kind of tight. So we're going to be building an outside clinic, a steel butler building. And we are planning to do that within um, the operating funds and, and pulling money from E&D and um, pulling money from capital stabilization. So you'll see in our budget money going into capital stabilization. And the reason why we're doing that is to not, when we got all our, when, when, when we got all of our quotes and all of our estimates, it was over four or $5 million if we were gonna go out to bond for the towns. And we didn't feel like that was the best way to go. We feel we can build the whole thing ourselves, have our students help. And if we take it out of our capital stabilization, we can do it for under a million. So that's the big difference. And that really helps everybody out. And includes, you know, the really large incentive for us is not just does it not um, add another burden to our towns, but it, it provides our students with a great learning opportunity. So we're gonna continue with that. Uh, we revamped our welding program. We have an evening program for that as well. And collaboration with GCC. We added a second floor to our electrical shop. And for those that know that shop program, it's one of the few that's had a waiting list for 10 consecutive years. So we added a third instructor um, to try to um, take advantage of the enrollment that is going into that shop. Our health technology shop is renovated for medical assistant. We refurbished our calf and we started a letter of interest with the MSBA. And we'll see where that goes in the next several years. I, I just got to let everybody know how we spent our money that was entitled to us because I think the town should uh, know how we spent our entitlement money. Um, we have our SO1 money that came in. We were planning on this before the summer even started and how we were going to re-enter our students in person completely safely if we're allowed to do that. And we took our SO1 grant and we purchased the fallen equipment on the screen. I don't have to read that to you. Um, but that's what we spent our entitlement grant. Now we were allowed the same amount of money in that SO1 grant as we receive in Title I. So now you know how much we receive in our Title I grant, 91,800. We also received $111,000 from the COVID relief fund. That's entitlement that all schools get, not 111, most schools are larger population wise, so they got a little bit more than us. But here's how we spent it. We lost our assembly hall. We took that large assembly hall, we chopped it up in four, and we made four large 900 square foot classrooms for two reasons. One is increased enrollment, and one, to get our students back in the building safely, we needed social distancing. So how are we gonna do that without adding more space? And we already took over some space inside the building with the veterinary clinic. So we expanded our nurse office. That's another area. If we're gonna have students in person, we were required by statute to have a COVID-19 um, diagnostic assessment room that would be separate from the main nursing room. In case any student or staff came down with symptoms, they would get assessed in that particular room and then they could um, you know, determine what the next steps are. In order to make that happen, we needed to hire a full-time LPN nurse assistant. So, um, and with our population growing, to over 600 for next year, well, having a nurse and a nurse assistant in a school that size with vocational equipment that constantly causes eye burns and flash burns and cuts and things like that that happen, um, we needed to update that a long time ago. So we also were fortunate enough, I think uh, we were the only school in the county that actually received um, a competitive technology grant. Now, if we're gonna be able to get students back in you guys know Franklin County better than I do. There's a lot of areas that don't have any access. So we spent a lot of, of our money getting Wi-Fi boosted, portable hotspots for parents, community, and teachers, Chromebooks for everybody, um, laptops, webcams, technology licenses, 
outdoor classrooms, uh, TVs, projectors. We, you know, we purchased seven or eight tents um, that we were able to lease uh, for the outdoor uh, classrooms. So after all that planning, we were able to get going. You know, we had students behind three, um, behind trifold shields at the desks. Um, we did a lot of stuff. And I wanted to thank the collaboration with our teachers, our teachers union and our administration all came together as one, not even the littlest bit of argument. It, it all went very, very well. Now let's talk about the numbers. So the numbers are, as you see here, our Franklin County Tech school enrollment trends were expected right here to be about 570 in district for next year. That is assumed to be true based on about 102 graduates. And we are gonna take about 150 or 160 students coming in next year. So that will bump that number up in district to about 570. Our total enrollment in the last fiscal year was 9.6 increase in our enrollment, which was a 6.9 increase in our budget. And we're asking from the towns a 2.5 increase. So that gives you an idea where, um, you know, I think many years ago, we might've been on the flip side of that. We might've been decreasing in enrollment, you know, and increasing in budget and asking more from our towns than the increase in our enrollment. So now we're flipping the switch. And I think that's a good trend to have. Um, how does it affect the town of Sunderland? Well, when I look at Sunderland right now, this is your 10 year trend. Um, with the number of enrolled students. Last year, I got lucky. Remember that red thing? Well, that red thing last year was over here and it said eight. I got lucky and it's eight. That's, I, think that's, I think you're the only town I actually got correct um, with the exact number. Um, we're projecting nine for next year and that's simple math. That's based on one Sunderland student graduating this year and we have two applications. So there it is. So that's uh, where we would be right now for next year's. So you can plan. You guys are still staying in the sweet spot over the last eight or nine years as far as your average is concerned. And uh, so that's where you guys are projected to be. And this is where you are in enrollment wise. So obviously, if you're not, if you're eight now, you're going to see a decrease in your assessment simply based on not as many students. Um, and here's what we need to add to support our increased enrollment that you just saw. A full-time guidance counselor, the financial literacy one, the maintenance position we just bring them back from something we cut eight years ago. The LPN positions out of a grant, the um, half-time English, half-time history position. Uh, we need a vocational support paraprofessional. We have a full-time librarian from a half-time librarian. So we're bringing that back to full-time. It was full-time many years back. And we're bringing back a full-time administrative position, which used to be a full-time academic curriculum director, but we're only having it 0.5 academic curriculum and 0.5 dean of students. And uh, with that, I'm gonna, yes. Got a question there. If I could, Mr. Yep. Chair, while this slide is up, thanks, thanks for, you know, all of the clarity and in, in the information that you're, you're putting forward and what you guys do up at the tech school, you know, I'm an advocate for it. That said, what of this space is being launched of this slide is being launched with any of that grant or ESRA money that could fall on the budget operating in future years? Or is this all on the existing operating assessment? Great question, Scott. This is all operating off of the existing assessment for a few reasons. One, we have growing enrollment to support this. Good. So um, it's, it's based on enrollment only. So the enrollment money, we calculate that for every four or five students coming in, you can justify a position Great. Uh, based on enrollment. So we did it on that. And the ESSA 1 and the ESSA 2 and now the ESSA 3 minus that's coming out, we're very uncomfortable with putting those positions, well, putting those dollars into positions that that grant money is going to go away in a few years. And now what do you do? Right. So, it, I was looking at the, like the LPN one, because that right. was noted as a grant. Yeah. kind of stuck out. 
but that's going to be supported through enrollment the following year. Like you just heard that we're going up by 50 and that's right. more than supporting anything you see in a grant is either going to be um, transferred over. I'm glad to hear if I, if I could, Mr. Chair, I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that the uh, escrow work and the backfilling with respect to uh, grants or Corona monies aren't launching something that's going to show up in a future year. And thanks for taking that approach. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Russ and he'll take you through some of the number crunching. Now, Russ, you got to remember to move around in your office because every time you don't, it goes dark because you got uh, that automatic. <laughs> so keep moving. All right. That's what, that's what happens to me. I got, had to do it twice already since you started. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to wave to my motion sensor too. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Russ Cobras. I am the business manager at Franklin County Tech School. Um, as you've seen with Rick's presentation so far, uh, we are a school that is in full-blown growth mode. Um, we are trending uh, with additional students from 30, 40, 50 a year for the last couple of years. Uh, for the last two years, our enrollment has grown by almost 15%. This past year, it grew by about 9.6%, I think we had for growth. And, but we were keeping our town assessments at a, at a low 2.5% level. So how did we do that? So the funding, the sources of funding screen that Rick has up on his screen right now uh, shows you the categories of revenue sources that we have coming in. And you'll see the two biggest ones are obviously the town assessments. So we, we rely heavily on our local taxpayers to help pay for the school. And also you'll see the state aid. So between the two uh, town assessments uh, take up a little bit more than 50% and then state aid and other sources um, or town assessments are close to 50% and then all our other sources make up the other 50%. Since we are in growth mode, so you've, you've, if you've been on a FinCom or involved in town uh, finances for a handful of years, you'll know that uh, the latest iteration of education reform uh, created this phrase that gets used quite frequently, especially out here in Western Mass, called hold harmless. So what happened is back in the uh, around 2010, 2011 time period, the state education formula is a per pupil based formula. So the help that we get from the state aid and the state's requirement of the local towns to support schools is based on a per pupil formula. Well, in, two, in right around 20, 2008, 2010, the state realized there's a lot of schools throughout Massachusetts and especially in Western Massachusetts where the school enrollment is dropping. So what that meant was technically, if you followed the original education reform formula that the state created, schools with dropping enrollment should lose some dollars in, in state aid because it's a per pupil based formula. Well, the state decided that wasn't gonna be popular. So what they did do is they allowed schools to keep the same amount of aid they received the previous year from the state, holding them harmless for their declining growth. So where does Franklin County Tech fall into all of this? Well, if you remember earlier, Rick kind of showed you a slide of what we had for our enrollment, and it started fairly high on the left-hand part of the screen. You saw it dip down to 400-something students that we had, and now it's going back up towards the 550, 600 mark. We, are, we have grown our school out of the hold harmless clause, so now that when we add students, we will be adding additional dollars coming from the state chapter 70 formula. So to Scott's question earlier is how are we adding all of those positions that Rick talked about uh, without tapping into ESSER, ESSER 1, ESSER 2 funds, uh, any of the major COVID relief packages. And it is by plan. We shrank the school several years back. And I know, you know, Scott and Tom will remember this because I, I remember your faces from as many years as I've been here. Um, you know, there were times that we, we reduced our staffing. Um, we were been lucky enough to do it through attrition and other forms, not, not mass layoffs. And now we're in full growth mode. So we're growing it back. So we are, uh, depending on our towns for a little bit of that growth, state aid for a lot of bit of that growth. We are also tapping into our E&D funds and we're also tapping into um, 
some of our tuition revolving funds that we use uh, to, to fund our system. So we've got a 13, almost 13 and a half million dollar budget. And the uses of that budget is what Rick's got up on the screen now. And you'll notice, so this is our appropriations. This is how we're going to spend the money. And for the most part, you'll notice the big increases are in the places where student services are occurring. So when Rick showed you those screens earlier, a lot of those screens were the people who are going to be in front of uh, or directly servicing the students. So you see about a $400,000 increase in instructional service. You see some increases in other student services. Uh, some increase in our pupil transportation, and that will probably continue to trend upward because we're going to need to add a bus route or two as we bring in 50 to, uh, 50 to 75 more students than we had here coming to our school a couple of years ago. So we can only stuff the buses so much, and then we'll have to add some routes. Um, so for the most part, the increases are, are logical. We are also predicting an increase in our insurances, and that is not a reflection of any uh, premium increase. Uh, Sunderland, I believe, also belongs to the Hampshire Health Group, as we do. And uh, there is no, uh, there's actually a 2% decrease in premiums in the Hampshire Health Group for this upcoming year. Uh, but Rick and I are predicting that we're going to have more employees on board, and especially in this economy, the employees will most likely be taking our insurance. So we're, we're predicting a little bit of a bump up in our insurance costs as we go. And also on the screen, we'll note from the you know, second, third, uh, fourth item from the bottom, the transfer to capital stabilization fund, there's another maneuver of $300,000 that we're putting into the stabilization fund. So we asked $300,000 from the towns last year through our operating budget to go in to stabilization fund. We're asking for 300,000 more this year. That puts 600,000 in the stabilization. We had uh, a chunk of change in there, probably another 80 to 100,000. So we've got almost 700,000 capital stabilization. We have, uh, we will be building an outbuilding that will become a veterinary clinic. Uh, we have a bid that is uh, just coming in. The Franklin uh, Council of Governments is helping us do the bid. And as Rick said, if we went through uh, bonding and an MSBA type loan, uh, for that, they uh, cause you to hire engineers, architects, and all kinds of things, and it would be a $5 million project. We, if we are the general contractor, uh, we use some of our student labor, and we get the steel building with the steel prices, hopefully, knock on wood here, still fairly low. Uh, we think we can do this project for about a million dollars, uh, or maybe even less. So we Excuse me, Russ. I think we just had a, we had a question. Yep. Did you have a question, Scott? Yeah, uh, two, Russ. Uh, first is actually we moved from uh, Hampshire to Maya a couple of years ago. Just a point of clarification. No. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, our, hopefully our premiums went down too. They did. Yeah. Good. Uh, so that that said, uh, the second question was about the uh, legacy cost under retirement contributions. Are there one-time buyouts that are contractual that can be moved off of the budget and put on to warrant articles, which is a method that we've used in the local district, kind of helps some, with some budget stabilizing. Um, and I think that's it. So how, how would that work for us, Scott? How do you envision that working for us going to our 19 towns as a special article? Yeah, so I hear you. You have a scale problem because of the number of number of towns that are that are member towns. Right. Um, it's been a relatively easy sell to say that it is if funds available, which of course it works within within district agreement, to say that there is blank. I'll insert a random number. We have eighty thousand dollars of retirements this year, and instead of having it on the operating budget, which can get lost in the noise any given year, it's up or it's down. We want to put it in front of you and say it's one time because it truly does go away next year. And that level of transparency has been helpful at the, at the town meeting level for people to understand that some of these legacy costs can be removed from the operating budget and they can be put in in the form of a question. And once, you're, once you hit that tipping point, it's pretty straightforward, but it does give the town meeting an opportunity to discuss you know, what those costs necessarily are and importantly, I think to me more importantly, that you know it's out of 
uh, the operating budget noise. You know, the wrap is it's in 100,000 this year and it goes away. That's the new zero next year. No, I, un I understand. Part of our, uh, the retirement contributions you see on the screen, on the appropriations screen for us, is a, a point blank assessment from the Greenfield Retirement System. Got it. So, okay. So I, so I don't know if you've, you're also considering, do you take that and put it in a special article in your town meeting, or is that part of your regular retirement costs? So we, most of that, the cost you see on the screen is a repetitive annual assessment for our, our non-teachers because Got Mass it. Teachers Retirement System in the state takes care of our, our teacher contributions. So you don't have a, a bump, say, uh, I'll, I'll pick a random number. Four are retiring, four gave you notice, two gave you surprise notice. I got six that are leaving. It's a bump of blank, whatever that blank is inside the budget, right? In yep. this year, because they're gone. Correct. And then next year, that doesn't exist. So where does that Correct. where does that so, curve so that, work out right. in so, how you guys approach it? So that's in that's in that 375 number for retirement contributions, but the portion of that is probably less than 10%, maybe 5% of that number each year. Um, yep. Usually if I had a veteran teacher going out um, with prop, well, with or without proper notice, and we have, uh, as you know, the teacher's contract, we've got to, we got to stick to it. But uh, so that, you know, that could be a 20 grand a person in a given year. Okay. Um, we are, we are not in a, a mode here where we have a ton of retirements. Um, the concept that you raise has been something, so as, as towns and schools go to fund the OPEB liability, the other post-employee benefits for retirees, that is uh, my industry, the accountants industry, the CPAs kind of forcing everyone to realize that, yes, you, you, not only do you have these costs annually as they leave in the form of retirement bonuses, but we should all be funding their benefits until they pass away. So with actuarial tables in the whole nine yards, uh, we haven't even got to the point, Scott, where we're properly funding our OPEB liability. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion to try to sit there with John Q Public and explain to them uh, why, why in the uh, 21st century are we now paying for retirees when we were paid as you go for the last 200 years and now the taxpayers have a double hit. You're paying as you go for the current retirees and you're trying to salt away money for the older retirees. So that's, that's, that's a conversation for, for a, um, a, a headier crew than, than, than I would be a participant in, that's for sure. No, you're um, right. I appreciate you taking the time for that. It's something yeah. with, a, with a smaller population in the, in the case of ours, four towns, it seems to work out when there's an anomaly in a given year. And you're right, that, that uh, contribution for you guys and your retirement come, your retirement program uh, and LPEB are completely divorced of each other. You're absolutely right. Thanks, Russ. You, you are welcome. So, um, so, so, so how do we know uh, we're doing decent? So this chart that Rick's got up on the screen is, is Franklin County Tech's way of saying, how are we doing as a school? So there's a couple of areas we can compare ourselves to. We can compare ourselves to some trends statewide. We can compare ourselves to the other, the other sending school districts because that's, that's the taxpayer dollars, the shared pool of taxpayer dollars that we use to fund our school. And then we can also compare ourselves to other vocational schools of our size. So what this chart shows is the blues are the schools in our county. So that's how much money is being spent above the state foundation budget formula. So there are very few schools, they're mostly inner city schools across the state that actually spend right at the state foundation budget formula, which is the state's fictional school budget that they feel is the minimum amount you need to run a school. Everyone, as you can see, the state average across the state there, it averages that they are above uh, foundation by 26.1%. So I, I compare ourselves to the state schools in general, our county schools, and then I compare ourselves to vocational schools of our size. And you'll see that we're right in the ballpark of the state average in vocational schools of our size. So if I stay in that neighborhood, I feel like I'm, I'm keeping our school district funded and in a decent neighborhood. I wouldn't wanna to drop too low 
and be scrounging for dollars. I wouldn't want to be too high and, and really taxing the taxpayer, as one would say. So this is how I know we're doing okay. There's other ways of, for us to check. So if we were getting out of whack, there are per pupil uh, expenditure analyses that are at the state DESE level that Rick and I can track and we can say, are we overfunded in administration, underfunded in, in uh, transportation services, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of analyses we can do. So how is Sunderland doing as far as uh, the assessments go for Franklin County Tech? You have, uh, Rick shared the number with you, you have eight students that are going to be used for your uh, 2022 budget assessment. That's the la latest October 1 count, the eight students. So we have Sunderland at a local assessment of 143,566. And again, uh, as, as regulars will know to this meeting that you are always on the high side of our per pupil assessments because the state deems you as one of our wealthier towns and you have the ability to pay more towards education than some of our poorer towns. So if you compared yourself to Orange, which is on the other end of the spectrum, uh, they pay $7,817 in their local assessments. So they use fewer local tax dollars to fund uh, Franklin County tax than the towns such as Sunderland, Conway, Deerfield. Uh, you all are the rich folk, at least in the state's mind you are. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it doesn't feel it when you're looking at your checkbook, but, and then uh, your capital assessment for this coming year, I think is going to actually dropping just a little bit. It's not a straight line assessment on capital, a straight line amortization schedule, but um, you'll see that Sunderland's assessment is somewhere, let's see, where are you around 10-3? Um, and it'll always be somewhere in that neighborhood, but it's going to fluctuate year to year. So we, and our assessment form is a little bit different on the capital side than it is on the operating side. And this was for the project that we got, uh, that we did uh, windows and doors, uh, parking lot repaving, um, a re roofing, a re skin on our roof. Um, so this is a truly a big capital project that was funded and uh, belongs in this assessment category as far as getting it paid for. And then the last screen, I, oh, that's it. Then, uh, you know, your assessment, I have another analysis. If you got my budget book, your assessment actually went up only, or went down 23%, even though your enrollment went down 20%. So you actually got a little bit better. So one of the, one of the few years that the state gave you a, a little bit better bump than normal. Um, you got a little bit of a break, but there's been many, many years where Sunderland was paying because of the state minimum contribution formula, uh, a greater chunk uh, of the assessment um, than what a per straight per pupil cost would have been. Did I miss anything, Rick, that you'd like to add? Um, no, you did a nice job and um, pretty, I got it pretty clear and each time you change it up a little bit. So that was a nice one. Uh, you, you know, it's good to mention the Greenfield retirement savings and how that's a little bit different than um, some of the other school districts as well. So that was very helpful. I, I was just gonna say, do we have any questions? Yes, go ahead. So what is out of district enrollment and what reliance by percentage are we working with out of district enrollment revenues to fund the operating budget or is that going somewhere else? Nope, we have um, about 30 out of district students and basically all of it's going to help fund the operating budget. Okay. Follow up if I could, Mr. Chair? Yeah, and then Tom. So with that out of district uh, and your growing enrollment, how much of the growing enrollment is district enrollment and do you have, have you thought about a couple of years of projection knowing that out of district pays the full ride and in district, of course, is assessment? Right. Yeah, we, um, you know, we pretty much, you know, started recalculating. I try to do a 10 year trend based on kindergarten enrollment and first grade enrollment. And I try to project how that would then filter up. And when you project 
project that I've learned over the years that you always have to decrease it once you get out of the middle school, because now that starts to kick in school choice, that starts to kick in homeschool, all those other variables. So the um, it's not really a true assessment, but we get a pretty good idea when we do a 10 year trend. And our out of district numbers, we were expecting to go up. They've actually come down over the last several years, but we are anticipating those going up totally based on um, the addition of two new um, two new vocational technical programs in the veterinary science and the medical assistant. That seems to be a draw and we're seeing it this year in our application pool. That seems to be a draw with our out of district students. You know, you have um, some of the kids that might go to Smith Voke um, for animal science or things like that, that live in Charlemont or Ashley or Rowe. I mean, we've even had some from Frontier and Sunderland in the past um, that now are coming to us. And I think that out of district um, number, we are anticipating that going up. Did, did you have a more question? Yep. I just want to understand that you're projecting five-year-old welders coming yeah. based on a 10-year. <laughs> Good job. I like that. Yeah, I was wondering <laughs> how that worked. Well, you know, they, you know, we just started to see how they play with the Legos and we take it. Ah, <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> well done. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Did you have a question, Tom? Uh, a, a couple things. Do, do you know what... Are, are you projecting what your maximum capacity is going to be? Our capacity was done through an outside consultant back in 2007 at 642 based on our current building envelope. Um, we are projecting over the next six to 10 years that our enrollment is going to be in the vicinity of 575 to 625. We're projecting that uh, it would be in that particular range. Um, we are also um, put an interest with the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, and see where we go with that, because we would be one of the last vocational schools in the state right now without a, without a new renovated or brand new building. And based on increased enrollment and being one of the last ones, um, who knows where we'll be? It could be 10 years from now, it could be three years from now, but it'll be somewhere in between. Do you, uh, are, are you still looking at your shops? Are you well performing shops versus shops that may need help? Or Absolutely. are you looking at bringing another class or different uh, shops in? We constantly review shop enrollment. That's one of the big indicators on what's going on in the county, where are the jobs, what's of interest of the students. So we continually monitor if any given shop has a bad year here and there, you know, that's not, having a bad year is not a trend. It's when it starts to trend over three or four years that we really start to become concerned as we did with the business technology shop five, six years back and got rid of that. They had a four year trend averaging about two or three kids. So that became obvious. And then when we start a new shop program and that that goes through the roof, you start to know, um, wow, there's a really good interest out there. So we continue to monitor that. Um, how's the women in trade program been going? And like, what kind of like outreach are you working on for that? Well, we got kind of stagnated when COVID hit. You know, that was a big hit the first year right before COVID hit, um, where we utilized the Jadukes Auditorium, their brand new auditorium. We filled all our freshmen there. We had a panel of 12 female business owners um, taking questions from the audience, being directed, getting to meet them afterwards, having tables where they each had to ask three questions to them. And out of that came co-op jobs. Out of that came an increase in um, a lot of the girls going into non-traditional trades. So it was really powerful and exciting, a lot of enthusiasm, then COVID hit and we did it remotely. So it doesn't have the same kick, but we're very optimistic yep. next fall, we can get back into that. Oh, good, good. All so right. uh, Rick, one thing I'd like to, like to uh, 
I was up at the tech school on Friday at the uh, vaccination clinic. I would want to thank uh, you guys for offering your facility. Well run, well run uh, clinic. And you guys did a, num a very nice job supporting it. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. My arm still hurts though, but that's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <sighs> All right, thank you guys for your presentation. Anybody have any other questions at all? All right, so it looks like we'll see you in a year. <laughs> hey, take care. Bye bye. Thank you all. Good, for thanks being for all the great work. All right, yeah, thanks. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks have a good night. Support. All right, uh, next up we have our COVID 19 update. I don't, uh, I don't see Lori on there, so I'll, I'll just shoot it over to you, Jeff. Yeah, unfortunately, she wasn't able to join tonight, but she yeah. did send me an email. Um, I think we have, if my calculations are correct, 15 active cases in town. Um, as of last week, there were 13, I think three of them were unactive as of tonight, and then there have been five more. So I think that puts us at 15. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think still uh, looking fairly good in that gray green range. Um, haven't seen another spike like we did in, in uh, early February. Um, so I think that that's promising. Um, the st still haven't seen uh, any spread in school uh, um, cases. I think there may have been one at Frontier that I saw um, in the last two weeks, but that uh, nothing at the elementary school. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to mention is the federal legislation, the American Recovery Plan Act, uh, was passed and signed into law and that has additional funds um, both for individuals and states and municipalities and schools and not all of the regulations or uses are known at this time but we're certainly looking into that and and how we might be able to use those funds okay. so mr chair if i could yeah go ahead the uh, i just like to remind everybody that um, I'm hearing of more and more people that are getting signed up to get vaccinations. Um, just want to remind people that um, don't, I know it's tough, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, you may not feel like you're getting anywhere, but you are right now. The state did come out with a wait list uh, that you can register. So when your group is able to get vaccinated, you will get a notification. So but though, that wait list is for the large scale vaccination sites. And that can be found at mass.gov backslash COVID-19 dash vaccine. So you can get on a wait list and all the matter, that's one of the large, one of the large scale facilities okay and the large the large uh, scale vaccination sites are at Fenway Park which is going to be going over to the Heinz uh, uh, Convention Center next very shortly because their Boston Red Sox will start playing home games with fans uh -huh. uh, Gillette Stadium sure. Gillette Stadium in Foxborough the Reggie Lewis Center in Boston the Doubletree Hotel in Danvers the Eastfield Mall in Springfield and the Natick Mall in Natick and the former Circuit City in Dartmouth, which is in the southeast part of the state. So if you do sign up, you will also be getting a weekly update from the state to tell you about what how things are transpiring. So if you want are thinking of definitely getting a vaccination, want to get on the wait list, I would recommend doing that. You will get an update. Also, just so people know that the state of Massachusetts right now receive is, receive, receive is, receives approximately 150 doses weekly. Um, thousand. 150,000 doses weekly. If 
Uh, so, and, and that's 83,000 are sent to the seven big sites, 38,000 go to the state's 12 regional collaboratives and 25,000 for the community health centers. Um, so they're, the best bet is to go to the, the larger vaccination sites. At the same time, CVS um, is basically opening up almost all their stores to doing the vaccinations as well. So you can go on online to CVS, which is www.cvs.com backslash immunizations backslash COVID-19 vaccine. And you could go on that website to potentially sign up also. So there are, there are um, places opening up uh, this week, hopefully Massachusetts, I mean, the Sunderland Franklin County is receiving a thousand of the Johnson and Johnson. So latest we heard is again, a thousand Johnson and Johnson's are the one shot. So I can only tell you that things are getting better with the vaccinations and it looks like we're going to be able to turn the corner. Thank you, Mr. Excellent. Thanks. That's good news. Every little bit helps. Yes, Jeff. Sorry, I, I wanted to yeah. add one one more thing, which is that the um, Board of Health Chair is working very hard also to get vaccines to our homebound population. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it, there's a different pool of vaccines from the state for, for homebound vaccinations and um, Amherst has been working with some communities in uh, e Eastern Hampshire County um, and uh, on a pilot program and they had reached out to us and I know the South County EMS is um, the Board of Oversight is meeting on Thursday and I think they're going to be discussing a program for homebound seniors too so we're looking at all of the options to get um, vaccines to to our homebound population as soon as possible. I was gonna ask about that. Thanks, that's good. Good news. <clears throat> all right, any other um, COVID related updates and all? That's it. All right, next up is our uh, sort of open section for any budget discussions. <clears throat> I don't know what we had on the agenda for this week. I don't know if there was anything specific we wanted to cover at all. So. If I could, Mr. Chair, uh, yeah. this is an extension of the capital, but also global budget discussions. You know, as our big spreadsheet fills in and our first pass at revenue based on last year's what's come back from state certifications um, into the current years and the current ask, we're we're in the 300 to 300 and 300 to 300 plus thousand dollar uh, range in a gap right now between revenues and expense requests as we actually see them. That's important to bear in mind. Yeah. Uh, and those are gonna continue to be refined over the next several weeks. Um, it was good to hear from the tech school, but it's also wary. I think it's important to be wary about future years. It's nice to say that we're in a, a sweet spot, I think Russ said, or uh, Rick said that we've been pretty consistent with respect to uh, enrollment, but that can, that can pivot quickly. You know, we've had those years where a quick six change and suddenly it's like, oh my God, what happened to the tech school? Yeah, well, their budget exactly. went up three or 4%, but you had six more, six more students go. Yep. Um, so that said, um, I think it's important to bear in mind as we go forward, we're looking at that 300 plus thousand dollar range of a, a gap to be dealt with. I'd like to pivot, if I could, looking a little bit at the master spreadsheet. And thanks so much for uh, sharing that uh, updated version, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you know, we have about 107. This is pivoting toward the capital side of the fence so that we have two pronged discussion. Uh, we have about $171,200 that is no longer uh, excluded debt that's come, coming off, right? That's, that's the public yeah. safety complex of library, their principal and interest. I excluded the debt that's recurring, that's the bands, that is also the um, uh, sewer relining project that is uh, continuing to go on and is, is funded. Those uh, will have a continued uh, decline in their, in their debt. 
in the payment that the town owes, the debt schedule the town owes. But that 171,200 coming off of the tax rate, I think is important to bear in mind that may be the juxtaposition to take uh, for a long-term capital bond. We saw that tonight in the presentation with uh, uh, Franklin Tech, but they put a 15-year bond out there and their 15-year bond was kind of a, a slate of larger projects they wanted to bond together to get the best interest that they could and uh, execute accordingly. That that's the that's the blueprint for what the capital planning committee has been talking about now, topically for a, a little over a year, and then really this year, like, oh, how do we do that? Um, and with that 171,200 coming off of our debt schedule, although it's it's um, it's excluded, uh, we should look and see where we fit, and maybe that's the umbrella uh, to work under for a discussion for a bonding project for uh, the town's capital for particularly the buildings, not so much rolling stock. And I've been a bit of a needle that's stuck in a groove about that. Rolling stock is different in my mind than larger capital pieces that are uh, uh, physical assets like the buildings and uh, underground infrastructure that we have. So that 171, 200 stuck out to me tonight. It's like, oh, oh, there's a number we can actually start talking about somewhere in that that range. range right and it minimizes changes to the taxes exactly or eliminates what would them, that look you know, like depending on, on, on the tax rate uh right and so you know the tax rate dropping down a little to some extent impacted by the operating budget that's one thing but this 171 even 150 pick a number that you can get your head wrapped around and i think jeff you had a debt schedule proposal for you know four particular you know scenarios and this seems to be in that space. So yep. maybe we can talk about that next week, put it together in a sheet and, and say, hey, maybe we can make, make hay out of this opportunity right here. All right, now, especially with said, the rate so low. That said, that said against the operating backdrop deficit of yep. $300,000. So I say it not with tongue in cheek, but with every, every bit of reality, both feet on the ground. Yep, we've got some stuff to chew on there. I just wanted to put those numbers out there as people begin to, as it comes to gel to us, it's important that we share it with the public. Yep, no, it makes sense to set that stage and let everybody know like what we've got for our inputs and outputs and what we're working with. So, yep. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Any other um, budget related things for tonight? No, all right. Oh, did you have something? Okay, uh, I'm, we'll be getting back to that much more over the next coming week. So, um, all right, with that, we go on to select board and town administrator updates. So I'm gonna go over this way. So I see Tom first tonight, so. Um, okay, My, uh, I'm gonna start with something that the town clerk would like to have announced. Oh, good uh, job. Nice. Yeah. These are awful big shoes to fill. <laughs> they are. You're in the office, Tom. You better get ready. I, I am right. in the office, but boy, the shoes. I, you know, I, I wear a size 12, and they're and they 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 pale in comparison to shoes that the town clerk wear, wears. Were um, you supposed to be wearing your town clerk's rock T-shirt tonight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the town clerk wanted everyone to know that there are four people running for the two seats on the school committee. Okay. Peter Gagarin and Allison Booth Mayo were the caucus nominees. Megan Arquin and Kara Gorey have both submitted nomination papers for the position. So there's four people that are running for the school committee's two spots. The second thing is that the other was a uh, position on the Sunderland board, the select board, and the town clerk has received nomination papers from Crystal Drake Trombley. So as of the moment, Crystal Drake Trombley is on the ballot for the select board. Uh, the last day to register to vote is April 12th. 
So your last day to register to vote is April 12th. Um, the election is May 1st from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Sunderland Public Library. Nomination papers were due into the town clerk's office by 5 p.m. two and a half hours ago. So if, if you still would like to run for, for an office, you can do so, but it would have to be by a write-in campaign. That concludes my shoe filling in for tonight. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Scott? I just read you. I, just, I'm, I, I was a presenter. Yeah, there you go. I have uh, uh, four items. One carrying on with the town clerk's notices. It's important if you've got a dog in the town of Sunderland, licenses are due and that window is closing. Get your dog's license, please. And it's not hard to do. Contact the town clerk, 6651442. Check the website and uh, you know, just do it. It's pretty easy and it beats the hell out of being hassled with, you know, being dragged to court or worse. So just get your dog license. It's a quick 10 bucks. It's easy. Uh, if I could, there are three meetings this week, 120 North Main tomorrow night at 630. That's a, a Zoom meeting. This is basically an update. You'll see that there are stakes in the ground. We're going to begin that, that, not we, the process over there is beginning. Uh, Frontier Capital Planning is Wednesday evening, uh, and then Thursday morning, it's like the 18th, Thursday morning, right, Jeff? Thursday morning, police contract negotiations. I couldn't do it last week because I was in an attic, but yeah. it's okay. <laughs> now that I know I can take my phone in the attic, it makes so much more sense. We can all do it. There you go. That's all. All right. Um, and I noticed we did get a, a notification too that uh, they're starting a construction project just as an FYI for folks over on five and 10 in Deer, uh, like right along Deerfield and Waitley there, right, Jeff? Yep. That stretch. So keep in mind, folks, they'll be doing some work there. I think from right around the intersection of the Irving and the park and ride up to just about the exit, right? I think uh, um, to get on to 91, right? Up to 91 North there. The on ramp. So just keep that in mind. It's getting to be that time of year. In addition to the stuff we'll be having going on here in town. So, um, all right. And next, it's uh, Jeff for town administrator update. The town administrator corner. Great. So I will <laughs> stick with construction starts. Uh, I'll that. Uh, today, the the complete streets on South Silver started. Um, that's the sidewalk, sidewalk. and uh, bike lanes there. Um, and notice went out to by hand delivery to all residents just to make sure that there was something in each mailbox and be doing the same thing. Um, the timeline for the part on Silver the contractors estimated about two to three weeks and then they'd be moving to South Main. So um, once we get notice that they're sort of wrapping up on silver, we'll do the same notice to, to the residents of South, South Main to make sure that they're aware. Okay. Um, and uh, North Main reconstruction is continuing. Um, they're moving the poles, doing the tree trimming um, and I think they're going to start actually doing road work um, it, towards the end of the month, maybe early April is when they're actually going to start digging. Okay. Um, to question, Scott. Yeah, Jeff, on that project, as we see poles being slightly tweaked, do those require hearings or is that part of the project as the submission from DOT? So the two there was there was a poll hearing right i want to say august 10th for two yep. polls um by claybrook yep those were the only two that that my That's understanding was were, were required a hearing yeah got it okay the only reason i ask is there's a lot of poll work and as we right. get asked about it it's like 
were their hearing specific and, and you're right and it was a softball for a reason some were being really relocated the stretch the span was being stretched in some cases they're simply being eliminated from a space so, great thank you so so jeff there's also going to be some i was talking to the dig safe person today that was out there the locator and she was doing South, she was asked to do South Main Street and about they were resetting curb curbing also along uh, 116. Is that I don't remember that being part of the project. Oh, is that the separate project for the sidewalk work that's going on there? Maybe uh, I, I'm not sure, David, because because it was on 116 out in front of uh, Lens Lens Place. Is that the corner store? Oh, okay, because so, I thought they were doing some from there towards um, like the post office and that stretch. They, yeah. yeah, they do have a proposal to do sidewalks yeah. uh, basically between 47 to mm -hmm. North Star on the south side and then right. uh, the Sugarloaf Frosty on the on the northern side or right. oh, yeah. south at that point. But um, yeah. It, but mm -hmm. I, I and I know MassDOT's been talking about intersection improvements there, but I haven't seen a plan or any, you know, the last time they were before you, it was pre 25% design, okay. um, I think is what they said. So I, I, I was just wondering, cause they, I, I would, I saw the, uh, the dig safe person going up the street. So I stopped and at, talked to her and asked her what she was dig saving. So as one does, so was, right? Oh, it's just one of the things that I do, dig yep. safe. So um, I, I was, I, and I didn't know we had anything going towards that the bridge. Way. And That's she was true. headed toward, and she was headed towards the bridge. So, mm. okay. Thank you. Uh, I will follow up and, and find out. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, two new employees started today. Uh, Dave Zagorski, the new administrative assistant to the Board of Assessors, um, and Arnold Rose. He came in today? Good. <laughs> We're already doing better. That's a win. Uh, there you go. A win. <laughs> We're one Step up. one. Show up for the win. job. That's right. <laughs> get, get you a long way. Um, and, and the second is uh, Arnold Rose, a, a highway laborer, um, started today, too. All right, good. Welcome to both of you guys. Both. Yeah, that's great. All right, thanks, Jeff. Yep. Always good to visit the town administrator's corner. <clears throat> All right, do we have any um, public comments this evening? David? Hey, hey Peter, hey, how Peter. are you? Hi, um, just a, a, a minor uh, question, I guess, is that um, up until COVID showed up, uh, when you went through the budget process, and particularly towards the end of the budget process, did anyone coming in to watch and or participate? It was usually a pile of, you know, the summary, the, the the spreadsheets that showed what the status was of the various parts of the budget in town. You know, the revenue pages and the expense pages and so on. Yep. Um, that all changed now that we're online, and it would be really nice if it was possible to have those posted online so that you know non members of the select board could go and look at them prior to the meeting and yep. furthermore if we wanted to print them out so that you know sometimes it's hard when you all are going through something and all we can see is the one part that someone is sharing a screen for right and Good so point. you know i'm hoping that maybe you can maybe jeff can just, you know, you know, I'm not trying to create a bunch of work, but just sort of keep those things updated on the website someplace so that, you know, the few of us that might be interested in it have, have a way of keeping ourselves informed. Yeah, I think we can probably do that, right, Jeff? Yeah. Put a copy. Hang them right on the site as budget in process, you know, yeah. draft and date. Exactly. Revenues and, you know, do the whole folder. Yeah, that would be terrific. Something to pour over with a cup of coffee in the morning, you know. Some of us spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, so. You can see one of the reasons we stay awake at night, Peter, when you look at that and go, <laughs> oh my God, how do these guys do that? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's true, especially the budget spreadsheet because it is very, very wide. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and, and do you guys have a sense of a schedule that you think you might be uh, uh, using to, to, in terms of, of decision times for you know various parts of this process? Uh, uh, we got a we got a school committee meeting tomorrow evening, and there was that under normal circumstances would also have a budget hearing, but knowing that that uh, uh, the the whole schedule has been pushed out, you know, with town meeting not till the middle of June, yep. uh, the thought was, well, let's put the budget hearing off for a while because the more time we can wait before, the more time, you know, there's so many moving parts that the, the, the better we'll be able to do in terms of, of, of presenting a budget. So I think at this point, the intent is to have, you know, budget hearing and committee vote on the budget in sometime in the middle of next month, middle of April. And um, I just didn't know what, if you guys have any sort of sense of a schedule or not in terms of what you might be trying to stick to. Yep, go ahead, Jeff. I was just oh, gonna say yeah. that, uh, thank you for mentioning it, Peter. I was putting working with the town clerk who was giving me the election dates and I was putting that together. Obviously they're separated by a lot more time than typically uh, this year, but I was putting together sort of a, a master uh, local election and annual town meeting calendar um, to present to the board to review and at the meeting next week. Okay, um, okay good. Great, thank you. There you go. Yep. Did, did you have something, Scott? No, I was just gonna ask uh, that it be ready to go next week and Jeff's again ahead there of you. The go. Nice. Oh, I, it might be a blind curve, but it's a curve. Yeah. <laughs> I think earlier today, Peter Scott mentioned that there's a gap of three Hundred yes. to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. How how how's that for numbers? I heard that gives you a rough our idea. Starting point. Yep, I understand. We're down okay. in the hole looking up right now. So <laughs> that's one way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. that's one way to look at it. Yep, and you know, and if you know, keep our fingers crossed that if all things go well next year, we won't have the luxury of this much time, I'm hoping, you know, in that sense, we'll be back to a more normal schedule if we're lucky, so. I, I thought it was very interesting in the, the presentation from um, Franklin County Tech to have that spreadsheet page number 12. That, right. Put, that wasn't that an interesting, that, that's an interesting spreadsheet. And, and it's funny because although we have that foundation budget, that's not how much we can actually, you know, they said, well, that you know, you don't really spend that foundation. Well, we don't really have an option to, to spend that foundation. So. Yeah, correct. It, 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 I just thought it was a very interesting slide because um, we're at, I would say a 50% above foundation and yeah. the state average is around 25%. Yeah. Right. Well, it's interesting. Circling back, if I could, Mr. Chair, yeah. to uh, having the documents that help us make decisions available up on the website. Uh, Peter, that was the first, the first full round that I've had a chance to get you know, eyeballs on it and go, oh, okay. And we're right. you know, confident enough with what information we have to make that kind of early announcement. Now, it's still the budget process, but that's currently our starting point by having those documents available for everybody to see, you know, that helps make for a, a more, um, a more informed decision. Yeah. And, and I know we're still waiting for some things like local receipts and a few other inputs too. Yeah, it's a couple too, bits so. and pieces and, and that's okay. Yeah. I don't mind that at all. Nope. Makes but there's fun. not $300,000. Nope. Nothing under here. Not under your I, chair either. Nothing under there. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not there i'll look in my closet when i get home but no guarantees exactly. you know so yeah so that'll, that'll be uh that'll be good <clears throat> thanks jeff all right thanks peter and i think unless there's anything else that uh that probably concludes the fun for this week so um and I, just apologies because i noticed we've been having a lot of um lagging on uh, or freezing in the zoom thing so you'll hear us talking and then see our pictures freeze occasionally so just keep that in mind folks it's all the fun of zoom so 
and broadband. All right. Um, so if there's nothing else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn until next week. Second. Do a second. All right. All those in favor of adjournment? Aye. Aye. All right. Three to zero on that. And we'll see you next week at the same time and the same uh, bat channel. Thanks, everyone.